you're live. Welcome everyone to the Wakaban S. Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health at the Dalana School of Public Health, University of Toronto, monthly Indigenous Health webinar series. Uh, my name is Suzanne Stewart and I'm from the Yellowknife Dene First Nation. Uh, I'm a visitor uh, and worker here in Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory um, as a professor of public health and the director of the Wakaban S. Bryce Institute. And I'm very honored and humbled to be here today um, with our, our speaker for the month of February, uh, Mr. Ken Richard, and our elder in residence, uh, traditional knowledge keeper, Clayton Shirt. Um, we're gonna start off today with our spiritual opening. And then after that, I'll say a few words to introduce our topic and our speaker. And then we'll let our speaker, Mr. Richard, uh, take us away for about 45 minutes uh, to the land of Honolulu. And then we will take questions and answers uh, about 10 minutes before ending. So Clay, um, I'm passing you um, virtual tobacco, but I've also put real tobacco outside under a tree to pray for you and your family. Uh, in thanking you for bringing us uh, into a spiritual place for this session. Gwich, thank you. Uh, I'd like to say uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you're all here uh, virtually. Uh, we're going to uh, do a traditional opening virtually. It is a bit of a challenge uh, to do that. So just take a moment or two and just gather your thoughts and send your prayers and wherever you are. And I'll do this. I'm going to say this uh, prayer that I try to live by uh, every day of my life in this language. So my name, my, my, my name is Clayton. My spirit name is Ryan Wolf. I, I belong to many societies. I'm of the Wolf Clan, uh, Treaty 6, Saddle Lake. And I'm great honor, great uh, pleasure to be here today and to do this uh, opening prayer. So take a moment and just say miigwech. Take a breath, just say thank you. I'd like to say miigwech, I always acknowledge, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our first mother of all mothers, our mother, the earth, again, I pray to her, again, I pray for her, I give thanks and gratitude for everything she provides for us, the people and our relatives, the four-leggeds, the crawlers, the swimmers, the flyers, we say miigwech to her for everything, we send our prayers to her, our thoughts to her, we send our hearts to her, we acknowledge her as the people, we come together as sisters and brothers, we acknowledge her. We send our voices to and our thoughts to Father Sky. Again, we offer our tobacco. Again, we partition. We offer our Sema to spirits of our ancestors, to Father Sky. We ask them to be with us, to be with me, to be with you, wherever you may be, to protect us in these difficult, challenging times. We say miigwech to you, grandfathers and grandmothers. We love you. We thank you to help us, to protect us physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, Again, we send our thoughts, send our hearts to you, to Father Sky. We say thank you for the gifts you have given us. Again, we say miigwech to grandfather of grandfathers, grandfather's son, for giving the appearance of rising in that sacred doorway, that sacred Eastern doorway. We say miigwech to you, grandfather's son, for this day. You are set in soon, and we partition again for you to return. We say thank you for this day, for making the food grow, for bringing warmth, for bringing, making us see the scene. I say miigwech to you, grandfather, son, for this day. And if I've done anything in the past, I have this moment to correct it. And I thank you for this from my heart of hearts, grandfather, son, for this day. So our minds, our hearts, it can be one with this, we say miigwech. I say miigwech to Nukumis. We send our thoughts, our prayers to Nukumis, grandmother of all grandmothers. Again, I say miigwech to you. I thank you from my heart. I pray to you. I pray for you. I give thanks for everything you do for us, Nukumis. As my granddaughter sleeps, as my children sleep, as my partner sleep, as we sleep, you do this. I acknowledge this. We acknowledge this. You, you put the waters, the rivers, the lakes into order for us as we sleep. We acknowledge this as the people. So many of us have forgotten this for water is life, but we at this moment, we acknowledge this for water is life. And we thank <clears throat> you for this, Grandma. We love you. We send our thoughts to you. Grandmother of all grandmothers, Grandma Moon, you are so beautiful. I say miigwech to you. I say thank you. I say miigwech to you, 
great spirit, creator of all creation. Again, I stand here as just a man, for there is nothing beyond you, creator. I ask you to have pity on me, that I forget so often, that we forget so often, that we are the people. Before we're anything else, have pity on us. We thank you. I thank you for this gift you have given us. Life, I acknowledge this. We acknowledge this. We come together as the people. We say thank you, creator, for there is nothing beyond you, creator. I say thank you for this beautiful gift you have given us called life. All my relations. Miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. Again, thank you for allowing me to say this very simple prayer that I try to live by every day of my life. And I say thank you for coming today and, and listening. So, miigwech. Nasi Cho Clay, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, it's, it's very humbling to, to be here with both of you today. And I'd also like to uh, extend my gratitude and my thanks to all of the participants who have joined us today. I see we have over 100 people who have come here to, uh, to hear this. And, and that's, that's really wonderful. And I, I, I want to let you all know that this session is being recorded and will be uh, archived on our website uh, and our YouTube channel. So you can go there and find us if you look up Wakabaness on YouTube, Wakabaness Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health. Uh, so, um, so with that being said, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Ken Richard. Uh, Mr. Ken Richard is um, a person who has worked tirelessly for decades uh, for the health and well-being of Indigenous children, youth, families, parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles. Uh, through tireless efforts to challenge and change uh, Canadian systems of child welfare. Uh, currently, uh, Mr. Richard is uh, the uh, director of the Spirit Fund. Hope I said that right, Ken. You can talk a little bit more about it. As well has been involved in the 60 Scoop Survivors uh, group that, that has taken hold over the last few years. Um, Mr. Ken Richard was the executive director and the founder of Native Child and Family Services of Toronto for over 25 years. And I've had the great honor and pleasure of working with him uh, in the 15 years that I've been here uh, in the greater Toronto area. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken to introduce himself in a, in a, in a more detailed and better way and uh, to allow him to be able to share his presentation now. I just got to check, are you guys being able to see this? Yeah, so we can see it. Later. Okay. And, and please, uh, just one more thing to the participants, you can uh, put your questions and comments into the question and answer section, and uh, we will choose those uh, in the last 10, 15 minutes of our session. And I will read them out to uh, Mr. Richard. So thank you, please go ahead. I'm already glitzed. Oh no, I'm good. I'm good. So I, I start these uh, events not through traditional land acknowledgements, just asking people to reflect a little bit on where they are. I know where I am. I'm in Toronto, but I know if I if I uh, walk on Young Street, turn north, and just keep walking, and uh, don't turn, and I will end up straddling Lake Superior and end up in a place called Grand Portage, where I can. Uh, drag a boat not very far and enter into the western river systems end up in North Saskatchewan. So Toronto is a place that uh, where that road actually starts. It actually starts back in, in uh, to the eastern part of the country and these these are uh, roads that uh, the top, uh, topographers and cartographers generally car call uh, car tracks originally. But any car track you ever saw uh, if it had any, uh, if it had a proper A to B, ended up as a road that was uh, colonized <laughs> by the uh, by the settler and renamed. But uh, uh, Toronto is a well-established uh, meeting place and byway. It is uh, certainly within the land of the Treaty of the Mississaugas and New Credit. It is also under the uh, umbrella of something called the One Dish, One Spoon Covenant, which is an agreement actually between First Nations to share the beauty and the resources of the Great Lakes. So I just want to acknowledge that. And just finally, I just want to honor 
uh, uh, not so far from where I am actually, in Scarborough, in a place called Tabor Hill, there's 12,000 individual people buried. Uh, and these are Huron people that uh, had a feast and had a ceremony that brought the bones of their dead people uh, to, to one place and, and rejoin the community in a collective way, in a spiritual way. So there's an ossuary uh, that not too many Torontonians certainly would know about. Indeed, Torontonians generally are not very aware of their indigenous community at all. So I always make a point of trying to bring this uh, home a little bit. Um, today I'm talking about uh, the 60s scoop, and I'm gonna, and I, I'm mostly gonna show photographs. Uh, I've learned about uh, Zoom presentations, what I like, and you know, a tiny detail, little point form uh, read to me is not my thing. So I, I'm trying not to do that. Although, you know, here's a, here's something. You know, this is essentially this talk is going to be divided into three areas. You know, I'm, I'm going to talk about my experiences in child welfare. And uh, I'm old enough to have something called historical antecedents, which is uh, <laughs> something that takes a little getting used to. Uh, but I'm very much uh, an activist uh, these days and working, uh, and uh, I'm well aware of current opportunities. I want to speak about that because we can, we're at a cusp right now, of, excuse me, potential change. And uh, I'll talk about that further in what we call uh, the road ahead, what I would call the road ahead. But just to, uh, to put this in a, in a context, um, I'm, uh, I'm very well aware that uh, we, uh, the, that the Canadian experience, indigenous experience is not just one thing or another. It's a, it's a process uh, that started uh, at first European contact with this nation to nation relationship based on mercantilism trading essentially, and that it got perverted, distorted, unrelenting settler incursion created conflict and warring over land and resources. And of course, um, uh, the, the, you know how, where that went. Um, and so there was a shift also ideologically, uh, historically from, from that kind of relationship a nation to nation to uh, one of forced dependence and exclusion to the benefit of the colonizer. And, and I'm sure most of the people that have signed on to this are uh, somewhat aware of these things. The ideology of assimilation was alive and well. We know we're right now, thinking of tearing down, I don't know if we've actually removed a few of the John A. McDonald statues. And then, because he, that, that time and place in Canada was a time and place where the articulation of that ideology of assimilation was very strong. And within that, as you know, cultural uh, oppression, family disruption, and child removal, and two different kinds of child removal. One was a residential school. So uh, residential schools, I'm gonna only briefly touch on because this is about child welfare. But um, it's no accident, folks, that uh, when you look at a child welfare a case, and we'll call it a case, I, I hate that word, but a child welfare involved family, you're gonna find a residential school almost 90% of the time as uh, one of the uh, experiences of that family and probably through a couple of generations. And child welfare is there uh, to just make sure that the job is finished. And I say that, you know, I say that perhaps aggressively, but it almost felt that way. Um, but now we're, we're in that, uh, those final two boxes at the end here, uh, uh, the, uh, the three boxes, the, the 60 scoop is fading, not entirely, I'll speak about that. It's also, though we're into a, a, a recognition that colonialization, colonization, uh, oppression, and, and uh, social justice issues are systemic issues primarily. And uh, if you want to know where we're working right now, it is not case by case. It is on the broader level. And I'll talk about systemic change. And it's here, this is when I talk about opportunities. So, and of course, all leading to uh, reconciliation. And reconciliation is, I like Cindy Blackstock's definition of it not having to say your sorry twice, but it's really now we believe in the capacity uh, for new relationships and better outcomes. Uh, and reconciliation provides a bit of a roadmap to do that. Um, oh my goodness. Why? All right. I see what I have to do. All right. So I'm, I'm going to guess that this is not new to those who are uh, viewing this, that this this is a picture among among many uh, that is uh, uh, often displayed as an example of uh, what uh, the residential school system actually looked like. But you know, in my mind, these are really marketing shots. They're not really pictures documenting 
uh, anything uh, other than uh, a display of the effectiveness of the colonial process in subjugating not only uh, the physical uh, indigenous life, but spiritual indigenous life and the removal of culture, you know, the, the, the Christianization uh, and uh, the, 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 the absence of, of opportunities to speak language in the population this young uh, set, set things up very nicely for uh, a disaster that occurred. And that's been documented. And I assume that uh, you uh, are somewhat familiar with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, there are also, I'll recommend a video if you want the story from the survivors themselves called Muffins for Granny. You can get excerpts on YouTube. It really, in my mind, chronicles very well that residential school story. And um, the residential schools, as you know, they started, they started closing um, post-World War II. And uh, not, uh, not coincidentally, um, in the early 50s, in fact, 1952, the Canadian Association of Social Workers said uh, that we need legislation that would allow uh, social workers to uh, provide services to Indigenous people, not just in the city, because they were already engaged, but on reserved communities. And so um, we have child welfare uh, really coming to the fore as residential schools were diminishing. The only thing that tied them together was a policy of assimilation that wasn't not necessarily written, but behaviorally was absolutely clear, and uh, the trauma <laughs> that the generations carried through. And now I'm gonna go to, this, is, this one's a, a personal story a little bit, and, and uh, uh, this is another marketing shot, but in a different way. Um, I, I graduated as a young, a naive social worker who was an anti-poverty activist in, in the 70s and uh, looked around, of course, for jobs that, uh, that uh, would hire anti-poverty activists. And uh, guess what? There weren't too many of those. So, but there was plenty of jobs in the Children's Aid Society of Winnipeg. And um, there I found myself completely unprepared. I'd certainly been aware of child welfare. Indeed, child welfare had had some incursions in my own family, but it wasn't anything I really gave thought to. Suddenly I have, I'm in the middle of what we have, some have called the belly of the beast, the Children's Aid Society of Winnipeg, almost no singular agency removes so many kids. Uh, and I uh, was given a caseload, sent out, and all I had to offer, all I had to offer my clients was apprehension. There was literally no other services available for them. The whole system actually was designed to remove kids. And uh, at CAS in Winnipeg had uh, only apprehensions available, removal of children, and the placement of said children as far away as is possible from uh, their home communities. And, um, and it was a, you know, a tragedy. You, you, you hear some of the stories, but um, most of the stories are uh, not of uh, a tremendous, uh, the one that caught a lot of attention was a young boy named Calvin Curley who murdered his step, his adopted father in, in Texas with a, with a bat after years of sexual assault. Um, so that, that sparked a lot of change, but the everyday story of, of uh, the experience of in, Indigenous children who were adopted out, as we called it, not an official term, um, is, is a, a tragic insofar as the impact of that child removal over time, notwithstanding that not every child was abused or had even necessarily uh, difficulties with their with their adoptive family. Indeed, some would say today that they were very grateful, but by and large, the experience was a traumatic event in the child removal itself and the experience of the kids in care amounted to cultural and identity genocide, stirring in uh, often uh, uh, big sets of uh, bad behavior on a, on, on a part of the adoptive families with respect to their kids, either through ignorance or deliberate, it doesn't matter. I've just heard way too many stories about how difficult the experience was. And let me, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, people believed was uh, uh, that the, the kids were being bought and sold. And um, well, it sounds outrageous to think that, but uh, actually when you reflect, when you reflect on uh, what it takes, what it took back then for an adoption, um, you, you might draw that conclusion. Um, uh, the uh, CAS 
all they did was child removal. Uh, where did they remove the kids to? As far away from their indigenous contacts as possible. Who did they, who were, who was an ally in that? Often private adoption agencies in the States and Southwestern Ontario, Southeastern Ontario, but primarily in the States. And there was a conduit. I witnessed it. Uh, there was a, a very strong relationship between that system. And it cost about $12,000 for a family who wanted a child to adopt. And so $12,000 exchanged hands and uh, the commodity, and I'll use, I'm blunt, I'm blunt. The commodity was this child. And this is a picture of a child that I took who was about to leave. I don't know her name. There were so many on, on her future in, in a, just a family. I don't know where she was going. I do know, and this is one thing, and this is a heartbreaker, that I, because I was a, a amateur photographer, had access to a dark room at uh, the University of Manitoba, uh, I was, uh, mothers often said, I don't even have a picture of my kid. And so uh, I would, I, I took a number of pictures of children who were about to disappear. And this would be one of them. So just look at that child's face, reflect on that face. Think about her future was completely uncertain, likely to go to the USA. With respect to her experience there, it could vary anything from positive to some of the most miserable experiences that she can ever imagine. So. So that's one of the faces of many. I, 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 uh, I, it's, a, it's really, you know, we can get a little too academic about these things. And sometimes having a look at, at uh, uh, the real deal is, is, <laughs> is enlightening. So how, you know, how does this happen? What, what, how, how did it happen that these social workers, and I'm a social worker, and I'm at MSW, I teach at the Faculty of Social Work. How was it? that uh, a, a profession that was, uh, 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 that came to life in, uh, as, uh, in, in, in America in the settlement movement, which was quite radical in its own way, and in England in the uh, anti-poor uh, crusades. Uh, the, they really were exemplified by Dickens, and, you know, that, that industrial revolution, the concerns that came as a result of the kids. So, so how did it happen? Well, if you look at this, this is a logo. This is the logo of a, um, of, uh, a children's aid society in southwestern uh, Ontario, uh, children's aid of Oxford County, actually. And if you want to go to the heart of, I've got nothing against Oxford County, it, it could be anybody, but this is a logo from the 1890s. And what do you see when you see that logo? You know, uh, we find Britannia. Britannia, a huge icon of the British Empire, one that rules the waves. Uh, but it turns out rules everything else. Um, and there she is with her shield, uh, protecting the children who are huddled, safe and secure, safe from harm. Uh, it's a very compelling in a Victorian way image, but it, uh, that sense that indigenous people, that people had to be saved, that was a notion, that was a notion that first emerged in 1763 uh, with the Royal Proclamation that said indigenous people shall not be molested on their own land. And uh, okay, I agree with that. They should not be molested on, on our own land. But just that notion that uh, there needs a, that there was a protective element got very distorted. So there's the logo from CS of Oxford. You know what their mission is. Uh, it's not a, a logo that says, I'm gonna go and work with the family and prevent the circumstances leading to apprehension. Is it indeed a logo that says, these kids are gonna come unto me. I am Britannia, I will the waves, I will fix everything. And that was the popular myth of the day. Okay, you know, I don't know how old you guys are out there in that in uh, virtual land. Uh, th this is uh, an icon for me from my very early days as a, just a little toddler really, but uh, it was very informative. This is, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Cleaver family. This is uh, 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 from a series in the 60s uh, called Leave it to Beaver. And you have, um, and this is great, you have Ward, uh, dad, there he is. He obviously just got back from his white collar job. Uh, he is uh, reading, or oh, no, looking at, looks like a photo album, overlooking the photo album, this mom, June, all very well presented. And uh, there's um, uh, the big brother, Wally, and of course, scrunched down there is, is, is the beaver, as they called him, Theodore. And uh, that's, a, you know, there's nothing wrong with that image. It's, it's, it's lovely, it's white, it's upper middle class, it's intact, mom and dad, 
It's actually from Southern California. It's white skinned, it's white color. Um, and uh, within its own, you know, way was, you know, a, an entertaining series. But, but what did it really say about family? What a family, an idealized family should look like and television family look like. Do we get, when we look at these public presentations of ideal family, a sense of what family should be? And do we carry that? into our assessment of the world around us. I say we do. I know the child welfare law is supposed to be specific to say if somebody does that, they get this consequence. It's not, it's mostly opinion, it's mostly judgment, and it's not often grounded in much science. So we go into those homes, child welfare went into those homes with this idealized notion of the family, and what did they find? They found a single mother living in a basement, um, uh, depressed, um, uh, 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 quite frightened to the system because they know full well this is back in the 60s and 70s when you know there were no talk of indigenous rights there was barely a recognition of indigenous people at all so the vulnerability of those folks so that mom's in the basement always ca all carrying trauma and we have you know all kinds of expressions of that trauma with respect to child care so it's easy to kind of judge the mom and uh, she likely herself these days will be a uh, a graduate of the child welfare system. So she does not uh, look at all uh, like uh, the Cleaver family, like, uh, like, uh, like June. The mom certainly is not uh, reflected in that a young single mother that is being assessed by a child protection officer. Um, and um, so uh, negative, as you know, you make a negative opinion going in, you pretty much look for information that will um, support that opinion. So on it went and child removal became easily rationalized uh, 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 back in those days. I would say still is to some extent by looking at that Southern California family, looking at our indigenous families and, uh, and making cross-cultural judgments that were absolutely to the detriment of the kid and took us back to the policy assimilation that was established at the, at the turn of the last century and before. So. I just want to show you, because to me, this is intriguing. It took me a while to get this one. Um, this is a, um, this is a, uh, an adoption. These are posters promoting uh, adoption of uh, indigenous children. And um, uh, if you just look at the language, uh, you know, uh, you'll see it, it, it's from uh, Adopt Indian and Métis Children, which was a Alberta initiative. Um, if you look at the narrative that is articulated there, um, I, um, they, they, they say without a home, uh, they say without love in some of the small print there, uh, out of nowhere, where do you think nowhere is? You know, this is cabbage patch kids or what? So, so, so it's just outrageous that we would, um, fall for this, but many did, many did. Um, and you know, the folks who were behind it were honestly trying to find good places for kids. So they were all wrapped up in sincerity, but they were also wrapped up in the cloak of Britannia, which distorted their objective ability to really help these families. So um, it became almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. But you know, I've, I've been looking at this image and I don't think I can reverse. Oh, yes, I can. You see June? There's June, the mom. Well, let's just see, is June in this, this picture? Who is, if you look at out of nowhere, unto here, she, that little baby is being held by somebody. Do you think she looks like June? It's 100%, it is June. I'm just kidding, but you know, so almost all the images with respect to idealization of family were just replicated over and over again. And the images of the indigenous family out of nowhere, if you look at the, the on the right side of the screen, as the left side of the screen, this kid looks in complete distress. Um, and and so the, the whole picture is, is tremendously distorted. And however well intended these posters are, they're actually outrageous. Um, and I, I wonder, uh, how many people actually thought this was true? Well, I suggest many did because they themselves were conditioned in the same way that the rest of us were in the attitudes and, 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 and thinking of the day. So the system was self-serving. It was not easy. Uh, it was not hard to remove kids with that kind of dynamic playing itself out. Let me, let me just talk about, uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going slower than I usually do. And I apologize. So I just want to make the connection, though, in terms of local legacy. Um, remember, uh, so almost 20% uh, 
of the, of the homeless people in, in Toronto are Indigenous, and uh, one out of four Indigenous uh, homeless people are Indigenous. So one out of four. I want you to uh, know that we're about one point something percent of the population. So uh, to have a quarter of our population, the homeless population, be Indigenous, is that a problem or what? We uh, ran for many years at Young Street under, uh, on Young Street under a bar called Hoops Bar and Grill, um, uh, a drop-in center. And in the 90s and uh, early 2000s, um, we, uh, uh, it was completely full of adoption breakdowns. Um, they, um, they just were, it just never ended. Uh, and uh, adoption and foster care breakdowns. And they were very sad stories. These kids were lost. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about them in, in, in a moment. But uh, one out of 10 kids in, in foster care in Toronto are indigenous. Again, we're 1% of the population. Um, so, uh, you know, in all this, you know, I, I, this is what happened to best interest of the child. The legacy of that is homelessness uh, for so many of our kids, uh, jail, trauma. Um, uh, uh, what, what was designed to save them, in fact, hurt them deeply. And um, again, I don't want to make too strong a generalization uh, because many will say, and I've been tapped on the shoulder a few times and, and sat straight about some people's experience, and I don't deny good experience. I don't deny love. One of the saddest sights that I ever saw um, was related to this fella, Tim. Tim, Tim was a young kid on the street. Um, and uh, one of the saddest things I ever saw was his adoptive father uh, parking. Uh, 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 a short distance away from our drop-in just to have an opportunity to gaze upon his son uh, because their uh, relationship had broken down, but that father was just driven to try to provide safety. He used to call us all the time. How's my son? How's my son? So the degree of pain and suffering related to the collapse of uh, many adoptions, um, uh, what they call adoption breakdowns, just wasn't the, the children. It was those families who thought they were doing something good and who uh, misguided as they were provided you know uh, what they could and you know i found most of the time and i've done lots of interventions i used to be an investigator uh in child welfare it was specific for adoption and aftercare and uh you know it's, it's a try it would end up being a tragedy for everyone let me just comment on these four kids because they're real and i want to their names would never be mentioned you'll never hear these names and i can't give them last names for many reasons, but uh, all the, these four are real. Uh, and uh, they were those squeegee kids that we, uh, they, they were brothers in arms. They uh, lived, they wouldn't go to shelters. All, uh, all they, they built what they call a crib. And I'm sure every city has a place where all these lost souls um, are the, the blue tarps along the Rosedale Ravine. Uh, they harbor a lot of people and these these boys and they were boys lived lived in a tarp in the Rosedale Ravine um, Everyone they're all dead now um, Three of them uh, died violent deaths on the street. Steve died of liver failure recently. He was in his 40s uh, Tim is the most sad, saddest of all again. His father was parked across the street watching him caring for him at a distance Tim uh, was quite uh, emotionally distraught, generally, but uh, but uh, such a loving child. And 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 I used to, I'm one staff person that will still cry if you talk about Tim too much. So um, so he uh, ended up in a um, dead in the crib in the Rosedale Valley Ravine. We don't know if he was beaten up or run over by a car. There was never an investigation. But um, I just uh, want to. Um, just pause just a second for a reflection on, there's this boy, uh, somebody said they'd give him a better life and he's dying virtually in, in the dining room lights, uh, in the gaze of the dining room lights of the Rosedale mansions. So is there anything that isn't sadder and, and, a, and a bigger condemnation of child welfare and Canadian society for that matter than that image of that young boy, that young man dying like that? I don't think so. So child welfare is not for the faint-hearted emotionally, but I'll tell you, things got better and they're continuing to get better. As soon as I get my notes. 
I have been very privileged to participate in a class action suit that was mounted here in Ontario. I was one of just a couple of expert witnesses and it was a 15 year, um, a 15 year project. But we got, we got a judgment. Uh, this was mounted by Marcia Brown from the uh, Timmins Way, um, uh, New Post First Nation. And um, she said that uh, although her experience was not abusive, uh, she suffered from a erasure of her identity and it caused problems in later life. And, and that was very well documented uh, and not just for her, but for many, um, uh, we won. And I say we, because there was a whole bunch of us that were actively involved in that. My agency hosted a lot of the folks who were coming from uh, the North and had no place to go and were quite lost and intimidated in Toronto. So we created a bit of community and we went to court and we got Justice Billy Baba to agree that there was something wrong with child welfare. And he said, he said, this is Marcia Brown versus Canada. The judge stated that the Canada failed fundamentally in its duty to care. And that, uh, and that uh, uh, by not protecting the identity of Indigenous children, uh, they, they suffered loss of identity. Uh, they were fundamentally disoriented with reduced ability to lead healthy and fulfilling lives. The loss resulted in psychiatric disorders, substance abuse, unemployment, violence, and numerous suicides. So um, out of that came a, um, a settlement where 33,000 so far folks will be receiving a compensatory payment of around 25,000. I won't even comment about whether that's enough, whether it should be compensated in that way. Um, uh, but uh, certainly those who are receiving that compensation are very grateful, but you know what? They're really, they're not, well, they're grateful for the money because many of them are in poverty. So 25,000 is the biggest amount of money they have perhaps we'll ever have. But what they were grateful for was the recognition of their pain. And uh, that was powerful. And uh, I certainly lived, uh, lived that. I lived the highs and lows of that experience with them. And uh, so, so um, uh, that marked a fundamental shift um, in uh, how the various stakeholders would approach child welfare. And uh, just, you know, I know I don't have all day, so Indeed, I, I, I got to get going, I, I'm sure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the road ahead. So- um, 10 minutes, Ken. How many? You still have 10 minutes. I still have 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll use them. So, so um, you know, uh, there's, there's new things um, uh, percolating now, and, and uh, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic. You know, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over a lot of the development that's already gone on. We have a significant Indigenous infrastructure at child welfare agencies that are desperately trying to make a difference in their communities, some with some success. Uh, some are finding that uh, the issues confronting their children are so great that they cannot be managed by simple, a single kind of uh, social intervention that, it, that we call child welfare, even though we might use an Indigenous model. But we've got some good things happening. At the federal level, and this came as a result of the class action suit of, of the Human Rights Tribunal, and you'll know of Cindy Blackstock and the, uh, the First Nations Caring Society. I've been honored to be the vice president of that organization for many years. And uh, so we, we continued to litigate, and uh, Jordan's principle came out of that process. Jordan's principle says an Indigenous child, no matter where they are, have rights to the same level of services as anybody else. And that jurisdiction issue should not impede the delivery of those services. In other words, provide those services and sort out who's paying for it later. And there's a, you might go on YouTube, Jordan River Anderson, there's a, a um, uh, Alanis Obamswin actually uh, a story uh, that chronicles uh, his, his situation. He's a boy that died in hospital because nobody would take, take a uh, responsibility of providing the necessary services to have him die at home. Can you imagine anything sadder than that? The kid was six years old. So, so, um, so Jordan's principles are aptly named. We have, uh, some of you might, who are involved in child welfare, aware that a, a couple of years ago, Jane Philpott declared child welfare as, as being in a state of an emergency. And she called us all to Ottawa. I went to Ottawa. I was one of the speakers. I was uh, de delighted to have an opportunity to participate. And out of that came uh, a couple of things. The infusion of about three and a half billion dollars 
uh, to date that has been being distributed, not necessarily in a rational way because things that come out of a political genesis sometimes aren't very well planned, but what a huge leap forward you know, from, from like no investment or virtually none to substantial investments. We're digesting that now in the indigenous community. We are waiting for something called Bill C-92 to get a few, a little bit more legs. C-92 is federal jurisdiction, excuse me, is federal legislation that is uh, indeed um, intervening uh, with respect to pro provincial legislation saying we're gonna fund prevention. And, um, and uh, they are supportive of an uh, indigenous model. And uh, I have reviewed the uh, background papers associated with what they'll be prepared to fund. And I, I gotta give them credit. It's, it's, uh, it's progressive. It talks about family preservation. It doesn't even mention child removal. It talks about building in safety into child's lives and their family and community lives. It talks about indigenous service sovereignty. And it operates on the principle that families are not toxic. That the old child welfare system that says indigenous families are in danger to their children. That's been completely flipped over. And we talk about the strengths of indigenous culture. And that's what folks are working with right now. Not, not easy. Some communities have a harder time than others. But C92 promises with further implementation and funding to really change the game. Service sovereignty for First Nations will become real. And, and the most progressive thing of all is Bill C15. And that's the UNDRIP. That is the bill that will tie Canada to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And within that, you have a, a number of rights that would be associated with uh, the good and welfare of our kids, and none of them involve the room, their removal. At the provincial level, and I'm going to get into that in a moment, at the provincial level, all the provinces are desperate to modernize. They are tired of being litigated. They are tired of inquest. They are, I believe, I've seen a kind of a sea change, even with the Conservative government in Ontario. They're saying, look, we blew it. It took a long time for them to do that. They finally did and uh, modernization is on the table. Some of the work that we're doing um, to an Indigenous Association of Child and Family Service Agencies is with the province on creating a new standards, new training opportunities, and at the end of the day, new legislation that will harmonize C92 with provincial legislation. But the challenge is gonna be, folks, are we gonna be able to, when I say we, the Indigenous sector, are we gonna be able to do things differently? Um, we'll see. Uh, but we know what the guideposts are now. We know what the what the um, uh, what we should be aspiring to. We know what the rules of the game. Excuse me. We know what the rules of the game are, and um, and uh, it's, uh, to some extent we've been handed a hot potato. What I mean by that is there's a, not an infrastructure necessarily there that is congruent with indigenous ways and the legislation has got a long way to go, but things are way better. The question is, what does an indigenous model look like? Is, is something that I just wanna put forth and I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but let me go to just uh, the UN declaration. If you read both part two and part three, I'm not gonna read it to you, but it basically says you cannot take children away the way you used to. The kids have rights to culture, to language, to their families, and there shall be no discrimination. And, um, you know, uh, I'm well aware that uh, some of the most progressive governments in the world, excuse me, oppressive and authoritarian governments in the world uh, have progressive human rights legislation. So it's not a, it's not a guarantee, C-15, uh, but uh, it will give us something to work with and to hold uh, the system, if you will, uh, to account, particularly the federal system, which funded uh, uh, not only residential schools, but at the end of the day, 92 cents on every spent, any dollar spent in child welfare, at least in the Ontario, Ontario region. So, so that's uh, 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 the national chief. Uh, I did a podcast with him uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the conclusion was that UNDRIP is going to be the guidepost primarily that we're going to have to, and delightfully so, work with. But I want to say, you know, we, we need also to, you know, rights articulated uh, as per the UN Declaration might not have the nuances that I would look for um, when we're talking about something that is culturally based. So let's go to the um, child rights as defined by elders. And these are elders who are gathered by, uh, by Abenuji, Child and Family Services in the Kenora Treaty Three way, and uh, asked to, to, to uh, 
think about what the great law uh, and that oral tradition from their, their part of the world, what it, uh, what it tells them about uh, how kids, how we should approach children. So if you look at this list, you'll see that it is a very purposeful. It's, a, it's a congruent with, uh, with the UN Declaration, with C92, with progressive provincial directions. What I like about it is it has a fullness of thinking about all the elements at play to keep kids safe. It's holistic. It, and it wraps uh, the kids up in a cultural base, including naming things appropriately, and in this case, the Anishinaabe language. I will say that this is a aspirational. Uh, there's so many systemic problems confronting the good welfare of our kids. Declara declaring rights is, I don't wanna say the easy part, but um, we got a, a lot of work to do to ensure those kids get what they need. I'm just going to, uh, I don't know how much more time I have, Suzanne, can you just tell me? Because I can wrap up now or go into another section. Um, I think probably wrapping up and going to another section section might be good. You have maybe a couple, two, three minutes left. Okay, okay. Just to say, I'm going to whip through this. And my apologies. Please go and have a look at this report. This is the National 60 Scoop Survivor Engagement Report. This is uh, came as a result of interviewing 1,000, over 1,000. Uh, 60 scoop survivors across the country. It's something I did last year, just before COVID. And, um, um, you know, uh, uh, folks uh, were grateful for the compensation, but we heard loud and clear that they wanted a legacy. They did not want their story untold and they wanted it remembered to the generations. So we have a foundation, a $50 million foundation that is going to ensure a number of things. Um, and I'm just going to lightly touch lightly touch on, on that. Um, we asked them a number of questions and I, again, I apologize. This is my ruin. Um, I just identifying the, the uh, areas of focus and their recommendations. I'm just gonna speak a little bit what they thought was important. All right. Uh, so if you're thinking, if you're thinking, for example, and I don't know who the audience is here that I'm talking to, uh, I assume you're all stakeholders. So when you're thinking about programs and services and such, um, please have a look at this list. Please have a look at this report because it talks about what's important to the people who actually experience 60 Scoop. Obviously cultural rec reclamation, that's kind of a no brainer, but you know, they recognize mental health just as Judge Bill about it is an issue plaguing them. And that the connection to family uh, through unification and other supports has been very difficult for many. And the need for advocacy to make sure it doesn't happen again. The need for education uh, for the Canadian public so that they understand uh, what's happened to them. And in so far as that, they also would look for some commemoration and uh, some overall community development. One of the things we managed to do in that consultation process is to build a community of survivors. Some of the people that had been in the room said they'd never, never talked about their experience with anybody. And there was so many tears that we had to establish a kind of a talking circle where people would have an opportunity to just, just talk about that experience. Um, you know, this is a set of the organizational values. It's, 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 it's uh, so I wanna just make sure that I want to make sure whenever I'm talking now, I, I use this slide. I don't want somebody doing a, 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 a land acknowledgement that has no purpose or meaning or any sincerity. I don't want to hear people say our indigenous community anymore. I don't want to hear it's a good beginning. I've been hearing it's a good beginning for 30 years. And I don't want cultural tourism. And what I mean by that is taking the elder and putting them on stage for two minutes and then getting on with your meeting uh, and then completely ignoring the possibility of their input. I want to, us to go to, to something larger. And I, this is a national audience. So uh, certainly we have hundreds of recommendations in the various reports. Please have a look at those. And for our local people, let's honor one dish, one spoon. Suzanne, I did this for you. I, uh, this slide, I, I want to dedicate to Suzanne Stewart because she is so connected to this. Uh, Suzanne and I, some time ago now, were charged with uh, doing a review of Native Child and Family Services in Toronto. And uh, we, um, we spent a lot of time with the folks. And um, we, uh, we, and I'm not going to read it. It's there. It's the Bill of Rights that talks about the importance of keeping families together, the importance of culture, the importance of the client actually having a voice in the process. A youth saying, I want access to my parents. You can just 
have a look at that. But that is posted on the uh, front, uh, in, the, in the waiting area, posted throughout the building. Has Native Child achieved this? No, no, it has not. Is it trying? Absolutely. And uh, that's more certainly than the previous system ever did. Final words. Andrew Wesley, I, you know, uh, I, think he's, I think he just got the Order of Canada. I hope he did. Um, he, uh, I asked him, he's a, an elder from the, uh, from the, the James Bay uh, communities. Um, I asked him, what, what is child welfare? You know, like, the, the, <laughs> and uh, he didn't talk about child protection. He didn't talk about anything that I normally would hear uh, from uh, somebody when you ask about what should child welfare be trying to achieve. He identified that if we create a world where our children feel loved and have opportunity to experience joy, have peace in their lives and have purpose and opportunity, that uh, no child will be hurt. No child will need the intervention of a system. Uh, and uh, that's our aspiration. Those are, I think, the best words that I can end on. Um, and I want to say miigwech. And thanks very much for this opportunity. And everybody have a good day. Well, you're not off the hook yet, Ken. No? No, okay. if you want to uh, stop sharing, we're going to have a little discussion now. And I think we'd like to start with, um, with inviting uh, our traditional knowledge keeper, Clayton, to, uh, to make some comments or ask some questions to start that, that dialogue going. Um, as per your recommendation there of, of, of including our elders uh, in, in meaningful ways. So Clay? Yeah, miigwech. I was just uh, uh, thinking about um, what you were, everything you were saying and everything. I just want to say miigwech and thank you for your good words and um, thinking about, it is a lot of work there is a dark chapter. It is a dark chapter in Canadian history that unfortunately the majority of Canadians don't have any uh, knowledge of. And it's up to us to, to keep going and to keep saying these and keep bringing it up and, and, and pushing. And that's how I see it, just keep pushing and, and saying, hey, this is, this is who we are, this is what we're doing. And, and it's, uh, we're doing this. And, and it's just, and it's just, and it's just really, really nice to hear that. That's what I want to say to you, Ken, and and it just and all the hard work you've done over the years. And I know you've had a lot of criticism over the years, and all of that. <laughs> well, and, you know, know, it's a hell of a backpack to carry, you know, child welfare. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. and, uh, yeah. it's up to us to deconstruct it uh, uh, such that uh, the client sees there's some difference. That's our challenge and our responsibility. Absolutely. And it just bring a light to that dark chapter in Canadian history. And so I encourage everyone else to do their work. And so miigwech. Hi. Hey. Thank you, Clay. And, and Ken, um, I also want to echo that, uh, but I'll save my thanks for the end and my concluding comments. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, in the chat, so I'm pleased encouraging and inviting all participants to type your questions into the Q&A section. And maybe I'll start with one question, and you know, this is a question that comes to me a lot, and I'd love to hear your response to this, Ken. Um, do you envision connecting more with Black communities to share with each other and bridge experience and share ways to potentially deal with and heal from the impact of colonialism? There's absolutely uh, a common pathways for us, but I will tell you, uh, and this is, uh, this is a sensitive topic, so I recognize that. Um, and uh, what I say is not necessarily what other people are gonna say, but I, I spent, you know, when I first started in the 80s here in Toronto, uh, as the director of Native Child and Family Services, I was put on all these committees, where, all, uh, diversity committees and, and, and inclusion. And um, we were never given an opportunity to actually be heard with respect to our unique position in Canadian societies. And we had to struggle to, di to divert ourselves from that very worthy, very worthy and important file, inclusion, and say, we're not exactly about inclusion, in the same way as others, we're about the two row wampum. We're about paddling in our way. Uh, we're about service sovereignty. So, you know, again, we will find common ground. Oppression um, gives opportunities 
to work together, certainly. But the mission that we have is not equity. It's not equity. It's sovereignty. And it's very difficult sometimes to sell that. Because unless you're all in on some of these big issues, you seem to be deviating. I'm, I tend to argue for seeing if we can get it all done. What I mean, all boats will, should be lifted by our collective behaviors, but I don't, I see uh, us as sufficiently unique uh, to uh, create our own pathway at the same time being an ally and a support of all the other issues that come under the umbrella of oppression, including Black Lives Matter. Absolutely. So what do you answer to that, Suzanne? Thank you, Ken. Well, I mean, um, my answer is probably not what people are interested in right now, but given that you're asking me, I will say that, uh, that, that I think that right now we have a unique opportunity to uh, build relationships and work together, whereas, you know, the erstwhile mission of the Canadian government, and some may say that this continues, has been to divide and conquer all of those who, people who don't belong to dominant white society. So I see that as an opportunity to create relationships and to end those divisions. Um, so that's, that's my an answer, which is close to yours. I just want to get to, I just want to make sure we have time for at least one more question. And this uh, is a great question and it's, can you speak to the movement to abolish child welfare? Well, so you're talking about uh, perhaps birth alerts and all the other mechanisms by I think which child welfare. Everything to do abolish with child welfare. Well, sure, abolish child welfare as a intrude, as a, uh, a, a, a settler led, uh, forensic based uh, uh, apprehension machine. Let, let's, I think we're actually, through the work of me and many others, have not exactly abolished it, but we're in the process of transforming it. And uh, so a simple statement about, about that, I, I wanna say, you know, here's the other reality, and, it, and it's a lot of years in child welfare, and I would say I've seen it all. Uh, there's a lot of kids in distress. And um, uh, not every, certainly some of the children that have been removed by the state were in very deep distress. So I would not want to take that away. But that being said, the old, that forensic model that it wasn't accountable, the indigenous community that saw the family as toxic and needing to be saved, that is, get it out of here. Absolutely. And, uh, but substitute it with indigenous-led, culture-based models that also attend to some of the structural elements like poverty. Is there a reason why you know, child welfare is only working with poor people? Absolutely, there's a reason. Because, because they can, because poor people live their lives in a goldfish bowl and every problem is reported. And I, you know, it's, it's just no doubt in my mind that there's class elements to it. So it needs to be abolished. It needs to be abolished. And, for, and not just for, for native indigenous people, for everybody. The family is not toxic. Who made us believe that? Excellent, thank you. And we are quickly running out of time. So I'd like to uh, make a few co closing comments and, and then invite um, our knowledge keeper to make any final conclusions and then bring us to a spiritual close. Uh, reminding the audience uh, and our speaker that this webinar will be archived on our website at the Wakaban S. Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health. And to say that, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, as an Indigenous woman, I don't think I can talk right now because we're all touched by these things in different ways. You know, I did grow up in my culture, but I also grew up in foster care and I also grew up on the streets. I also went through post-secondary education, which was also very traumatic, being the only Native person, you know, experienced a lot of racism in my life, and I still experience racism on a daily basis in, in different ways, systemically, personally, you know, it's, it's, it's still a struggle for us. And when I think about growing up, you know, as a little Native kid in a white place in Alberta, and and I just see myself from a distance. And, and I think we all kind of 
those of us who grew up like that, we saw ourselves from a distance because that's what we had to do to survive, depersonalize from that theft of identity, from that theft of culture. And for us to all be gathered here today, Clay, Ken, Robert, uh, me, the audience, for all of us to be here reclaiming this, even in these small ways that we've done in our lifetimes. You know, I, I never thought in my lifetime that I would be in this position with, with all of you and with all the people who are on this call. And even though we have only made a small dent, you know, and there's so much more to do, I don't think any of us thought that we would, that, that it would, that this would be like this, given the oppressive backgrounds that we've all come from. And, and I think a lot of that is to do with the work that you've done, Ken. You've done this work systemically that has allowed someone like me to be here today. So I wanna thank you, thank you for that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Clay. Miigwech, miigwech, my sister. For... I just wanna say uh, thank you again for uh, just allowing me to reflect in, in, in this, it's, it's another view on what we've gone through as, as indigenous people. And I like what it, it was saying there earlier about what the elders are asking. And, and, and I'll just say it this way. I feel the same way. And, and it's just, what I, was, what I mean by that is these, all these um, foreign concepts who have come here, these foreign beliefs, uh, capitalism, Marxism, Christianity. And as an indigenous man, I denounce them all. I reject them all. And I, I, and I, and I know that there's a way to live with the earth and there's a way not to. And I know through the elders, that I've experienced and that we, we've been talking to and what, that we invite to our, our, our places that this is what they're saying in their words, in their sacred words. And this is what they're saying. And, 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 it, and that has to involve that that's with children, right? The little ones, the little beings, and to re reclaim our identity as Nishinaabe people, as human beings. And, 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 I, and I know that colonialism has really tried to erase that memory, what it is to be a human being, that being part of being a human being. And this is what we're trying to do. So we're, I, I just encourage people to, it's, it's, a, it's a big fight. It's a challenge. And I know, Ken, you've, you've been in the trenches for many, many years. And so I just want to say miigwech to you. And, 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 and I just want to say, um, with a little, uh, just allow this this prayer, and the, and the blessings to you and your family, your loved ones, and all the ones who are in those places fighting for the people. And I just say miigwech to our Creator, the Earth, the Sun, the Sky, and ask to give us strength physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally to help us all in this struggle. So miigwech to all of you for allowing us to share our truths. Miigwech. Miigwech, thank you so much. Thank you, Clay. Bye bye everybody. Thanks, Ken. See you later. Can't get out. <laughs>